This might just be the best budget gaming monitor on the market, and that's coming from someone who's reviewed over 200 different panels. It's called the BenQ Mobius EX240, a full HD 165Hz IPS monitor with AMD FreeSync and HDR capabilities. In the UK it can be found for roughly £200, while in the US it can be found for roughly $200. Now jumping straight in, I do want to commend BenQ's use of a singular DisplayPort 1.2 input and two HDMI 2.0 inputs. The latter is certainly impressive because it allows you to output full HD 165Hz with HDR. Indeed, this means that you're not going to be limited. Of course, bearing in mind that your laptop or your desktop's GPU will have to have HDMI 2.0 or above, or of course have display pause in order for you to fully benefit from the max resolution and refresh rate of the EX240. Now the reason I'm highlighting this is because some of its competitors only offer HDMI 1.4 alongside a DisplayPort 1.2 input and therefore those people who are limited to HDMI will be limited to Full HD at 144Hz with no HDR support. So with that out of the way, while plugged into my NVIDIA RTX 3080 via DisplayPort, I was able to test this monitor's input lag and objectively it came out at 3.1 milliseconds, which isn't either the lowest nor the quickest time that I've tested to date, but it's still very much impressive, specifically for a budget monitor. Subjectively, I will say, when it came to using this monitor on a competitive game such as CSGO, I found that my mouse clicks were responding extremely quickly, and therefore I didn't feel hindered by the monitor's performance. Now, aside from the monitor's input lag, the overall response time is also pretty impressive. Now, with AMA fully disabled, in other words, on level zero mode, I had the average initial time tested via the OSRTT tool at 6.23 milliseconds. That's what you can see at the bottom left-hand side of your screen, and also do pay attention for the RGB overshoot, which you can find at the middle of your screen. Now, as we move over to AMA1, dialing up the overdrive mode, you can see over here the average initial time drops to 5.09 milliseconds. Going over to AMA2, it further drops to 3.93 milliseconds, which is seriously impressive, but here you can see a little bit of RGB overshoot creeping in. Finally, in terms of AMA3, the average initial times drops down to a staggering 3.32 milliseconds, with the percentage in window sitting at near 87%, which is very impressive yet again. But on the flip side, you can see the RGB overshoot has creeped in and therefore there's a lot more red on your screen. Now, when it comes to the UFO ghosting test, you can see here the different AMA modes. And indeed, on AMA3, there's a little bit of inverse ghosting. While the OSRTT tool does seem to skew out some red results, when it comes to actually using it in practice, be it in a graphically intense game such as Destiny 2, or playing a more potato-looking game and one that's more hardcore-based such as CSGO, I didn't actually incur too much inverse ghosting, so much so that I actually used this monitor primarily primarily in its AMA3 mode. Now further expanding on this, the monitor does have a blur reduction mode, which is certainly appreciated and does as the name suggests. As you'll be able to see here, it really clears up that UFO. Better still, you can adjust the AMA level while in blur reduction mode, which is a real rarity on any gaming monitor, no matter what price point it comes in at. Now of course, blur reduction mode will limit the peak brightness of the monitor, bringing it down to roughly 180 nits, which is a roughly 50% lower than its peak brightness, in other words, without blur reduction enabled, but it's certainly going to be appreciated for those people that have any sort of sensitivity towards any sort of motion blur. Now better still, blur reduction mode can be used simultaneously with AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA G-Sync. In my case, I was able to test the latter with my RTX 3080, and I was able to run Destiny 2 at Full HD at 165Hz with NVIDIA G-Sync and blur reduction mode enabled. This is, yet again, a real good feature to see and extremely rare on a gaming monitor, let alone one that comes in at the budget end of the market. Now this does perfectly lead me onto its VR technologies and indeed the monitor has got AMD FreeSync technology built in and therefore should have a FreeSync range of 48Hz all the way up to 165Hz. 
Now, as I did mention, I've got an RTX 3080, and when connected over DisplayPort, I had no sort of black screen issues or flickering, be it on playing a game such as Destiny 2, or indeed running the Nvidia Pendulum demo. The only little disclaimer that I will mention over here is that the monitor when running HDR could not run blur reduction mode, and therefore instead I was able to run HDR simultaneously with NVIDIA G-Sync at 165Hz and at 1080p. Now I did allude to HDR and indeed the monitor does support it over DisplayPort and HDMI due to its port versions as I did mention before. However, the overall HDR experience is lacklustre, due to the monitor not even hitting the measly HDR400 certification, which in itself is somewhat of a joke. Still, the overall HDR experience is pretty good due to the overall colour accuracy being on point, and therefore doesn't look washed out or indeed seems to hamper the overall gaming experience that I was able to attain when playing a game such as Destiny 2. Still, if you do want better HDR, you will want to look for a monitor with HDR600 certification. Alas, over here, there are only 1440p monitors that I can think of that have HDR600, and indeed will mean that you'll have to splash out a lot more money and of course go up the resolution and therefore might have to even upgrade your GPU. Ultimately over here, for a budget monitor, it's good to see that the EX240 does support HDR, but just don't go banking on it being a mind-blowing experience and somewhat of a benchmark of what you should expect when it comes to actually getting a real HDR monitor. So with the gaming section out of the way, what about when it comes to image quality? Well here I must say I was left really impressed by its 23.8 inch IPS panel. Here it also has a dedicated sRGB emulation mode should you want to get better sRGB color accuracy and of course it has got a wider color gamut if you were to select one of the other options via the OSD such as the custom mode presets. Now in the sRGB emulation mode I had its gamut coverage tested at 94.7% while its gamma volume at 96.3%. As you can see over here also the Adobe RGB and DCI-P3 standards. Do bear these in mind as we'll switch over to the custom mode preset which unlocks the wider color gamut of this monitor. Now below you can see how it compares to the sRGB standard, and as for the average Dell TE, whereby closer to zero is perfect, it hits it at 1.24, which is very impressive. As for its maximum, it sits at just 2.87. Now as for its tested contrast ratio, it is actually a little bit lackluster at 855 to 1, at least for an IPS panel, but its measured white point, where it's 6504 Kelvin target, was hit at 6850 Kelvin at 100%. Better still, its gamma coverage, in comparison to the 2.2 standard, was pretty much spot on. However, things do drastically change, specifically in the custom mode preset, which I'll showcase on the OSD section. Here, the average Dell TE has dropped, in other words, gotten higher, at 2.05, with a maximum sitting at 4.98. You can see below, it does hit a wider color gamut, due to the gamut coverage and gamut volumes expanding in sRGB, Adobe RGB, and DCI-P3, and as for the measured white point, it actually gets even tighter at 6,650 Kelvin at 100%, but where the problem really exists is in terms of its gamma coverage. You can see here in comparison to the 2.2 standard, it's nowhere near as impressive as the sRGB emulation mode, and here you can see it goes absolutely AWOL towards the higher brightness levels. Speaking of which, in terms of its peak brightness, I noted 377 nits, which is higher than what the manufacturer claims. Oddly, the overall HDR brightness was lower at 325 nits, which might have explained my somewhat subpar experience when it came to running an HDR signal. Nonetheless, the monitor does get all the way down to 49 nits and therefore showing good range, and as for the maximum brightness in blur reduction mode, it sits at 182 nits, and indeed is almost half the maximum brightness that the monitor can achieve. Now an inherent limitation of IPS panels is backlight bleed, and indeed this is somewhat panel lottery, but on the tested monitor that I had, it wasn't too bad, and therefore it meant that when I was playing, let's say, darker games or watching, let's say, darker movies, I had no such problems with any sort of inherent bleed coming around the edges. Now on the flip side I was expecting a little bit better brightness uniformity given the overall size of the monitor, but alas that wasn't quite the case whereby on the top segment of my monitor it was a little bit off. 
Now moving on to the monitor's OSD can be accessed through a physical joystick button found unconveniently next to the power button but nonetheless it's on the off center right side of the monitor. Now when you do open up the OSD you will have a quick settings that you can customize and I'll showcase this very shortly and then of course you have got the full OSD menu. Now here you can select through the different inputs if you do have them enabled and then through the different inputs you've got three different modes that you can also select and then you can have the scenario modes enabled or disabled if you want. Now the quick menu that I just referenced before can be customized through this section and you've got a variety of different settings that you can quickly access if you so wish. Note not the entire monitor's OSD is over here but it's still pretty handy. Now in terms of the color modes the custom mode that I did reference before does provide you all the right options that you'll want. So for example if you want to adjust the brightness the BI plus sensor if you want to enable it or disable it which is the sensor found towards the front of the monitor and adjust the color temperature depending on the ambient light conditions and then you have also got the color temperature with the user defined modes and then AMA as well also alongside blur reduction. If however you go to one of the other modes so for example sRGB you can see over here a lot of the settings are locked out such as BI plus and blur reduction so it really depends as to what is more important to you and how you'll be actually using this monitor but I suspect a lot of people will probably want to be running on the custom mode preset. Now on that you have got the eye care whereby you can enable or disable BI plus where you can see it is grayed out at the moment and then you've got low blue light color weakness and also adjust by duration if you want to enable or disable it now as for audio you have got a few different EQ so to speak FPS cinema and pop and live I would suggest cinema if you are using the two 2.5 watt speakers that are built into the monitor. If however you do want to get superior audio quality I would always suggest a set of bookshelf speakers or of course if you're a hardcore gamer a set of headphones or a headset or such. Now as for the system menu you will definitely want to enable the max peak brightness mode over here because it really does bolster the overall brightness that one can attain from this monitor and indeed in line with what I have quoted before in this image quality section of this review. Now you have got an LED indicator which you can enable or disable and aside from that you have got some information as to how the monitor is currently running. Now moving past the monitor's OSD I should mention its aesthetics and indeed over here it's pretty stylish at least in my opinion. It's got a silver and orange finish in terms of its stand which I appreciate is not going to be to everyone's liking but for me it actually stands out in comparison to the rest of the crowd. I know that was a terrible pun but do bear with me. The monitor stand does give you height, tilt and pivot adjustment which are certainly appreciated although it cannot be rotated. It has got a three side borderless design at the front with a relatively chunky bottom bezel and that's namely due to the BI sensor which is placed towards the centre of the monitor. Now as for the overall chunkiness of the monitor, which is not something I would normally comment on, here I did feel that it's actually pretty large in comparison to some of its competitors. It somewhat reminds me of an LCD display from yesteryear, not quite an LED display which is what we have on review. Still it's not going to be much of an issue but something I thought to highlight given that we are talking about the overall aesthetics of the monitor. So with all of that in mind it brings me on to my verdict on the BenQ Mobius EX240 and on the whole I've just been left really impressed not only from its overall image quality but also in terms of its gaming performance. Its input lag is good, its response time is seriously impressive, then it also has support for HDR, AMD FreeSync and unofficial support for Nvidia G-Sync and just to add the cherry on top it's got that blur reduction mode which will certainly be appreciated for those hardcore competitive gamers. On the whole I do think it's the best budget gaming monitor that one can currently buy and it's even competitively priced in the UK coming in at £200 and in the US coming in at $200. As such it easily gets my best buy award. Now I'd be intrigued to hear your thoughts of the monitor down in the comment section below and if you haven't already definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification. All of which are greatly appreciated and allows me to continue delivering honest reviews like this one. As such I've been totally dubbed and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.